Hi there. Uh, we are doing another little episode for the Car Care Adventures, and today we have been at the iBox uh, in Coventry, where we've been running a Rupes training day. Uh, Jason Rose here has been presenting it, along with lots of other Rupes sort of royalty come over, <laughs> and we had about 75 people, uh, and everybody was really, really chuffed with the course. They took, took a lot away, I feel. Yes, yes, I got that takeaway too. I thought the uh, audience got a lot out of the day, and it was mm. a very productive training event. Yeah, and what was really nice was it was, it was very engaging. It was hands-on and lecture theatre. Sure. So we started off with a heavy two and a half hours solid theory, um, which I really enjoyed, even though I was just standing at the back with my ding dong. That's a camera. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like that. They said no. Um, but uh, then there was lots of hands-on sessions and going up and down and up and down. And we, we went through um, the DA, we went through force rotation, uh, and rotary as well at the end. And uh, the mini tools, you know, yeah. as well. Yeah. And because um, Rupert has been bringing out some really interesting new tools lately as well with the, you know, last year or a year and a bit ago, we had the Mark II 15 and 21 machines. Then we had the Mille um, and the hybrid, of course, came out. Um, and then you've got new rotaries. New updated rotaries along with the complete system. So it includes compounds, pads, as well as a new updated rotary tool. Yeah, and yeah. I noticed you were saying how the pads are they're thinner. Those who are fans of Rupert's system will notice the pads have actually got a lot thinner. Um, and it was all about, now remind me what the term was. There was a, there's been lots of technical terms today, and I'm, as we know, not particularly bright, so remembering these things is difficult. Did um, you take the test? No, I didn't take the oh. test. I couldn't find it. Every time I went there, you <laughs> talked about it. Um, but they're essentially, they're lower so that the, the pad doesn't flex as much with the movement. Um, around that, and so that more of the power of the machine is put to the to the paint, as yeah. far as I can make out. Yeah. So anytime there's an orbital tool and with a significant offset, like a large orbit tool, uh, the more pad mass there is, uh, the tendency to lose energy through that mass. No. Which is why we built in lateral stability. It's kind of a That's technical the term, but yeah. lateral stability into our foam pad so that this large orbital movement, um, the, the foam can actually more efficiently transfer energy. To it. Yeah. it. It reminded me, I don't know if this is a fair analogy, but you know, back in the old days, if we can both think back then, when car tires had high profile tires, yes. and now you go for a sports car and they put essentially a rubber band on there, yeah. and so, you know, yeah. you go over every bump like this. Uh -huh. um, but I get the feeling it's kind of like the low profile tire almost of, of, of the machine polishing world. Yeah, a lot of the energy from a car with a low profile, it, you know, more traction, that's one of the reasons for that low profile tire on a car. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, similar concept. And we specifically went after that low profile design with our gear driven Miele system. Mm -hmm. No, well that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, now, everybody watching, I'm sure, will know Jason Rose, but what I want to do is get um, a little bit inside the man himself, so to speak. That probably came out wrong, but, but I want to know, what got you into detailing and when? I actually started at a very young age. Um, my parents tell me it was in the crib. <laughs> <laughs> so what I heard, because I really don't remember, but what I heard from my parents is that when they gave me different assorted toys, um, I would throw anything out of the crib that wasn't the car. <laughs> so the cars I would keep, uh, and I would play with the cars. So I imagine it started then. Mm -hmm. um, but I really don't consider myself a car enthusiast, uh, although I, I love certain kinds of cars, but I'm more of a detail enthusiast. So mm -hmm. any, anything that has to do with, with detailing cars yeah. and polishing paint. and So even if somebody had a really cheap, rubbish Subaru, you'd still take some passion in, in polishing it? Well, I would definitely talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> and I, I've gotten very good at, a, at a doing a Little beautiful patches. spot like this, yeah. and then I turn the tool over because to you. And, and watch then you I, I can yeah, yeah. make fire. Um, but, but it really started in, in uh, middle school and high school. Um, got my first car, uh, and then I started doing the family cars. So I would mm -hmm. wash and wax family cars. And were you using two-bucket method in those days, or was it all still bucket and sponge? Mm. I don't think I'd learned two bucket method that time. Mm. That came later, but the um, the thing happened that kind of snowballed this is my neighbors would observe <laughs> me cleaning the family <laughs> cars, us, and yeah. they're like, "Wow, that that looks great. Can you do mine?" And, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it became a business. Yeah, and it was, so. I imagine street by street, and then suddenly the whole city yes. wanted it. Yeah. And whereabouts in the states did you grow up? Well, I moved around uh, quite a bit, but most of my detailing work was done in Southern California oh, in wow. the United States. Hence yeah. the tan, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so detailing in, in California is pretty much a year-round business, and mm -hmm. um, it's easy to do there because of the, the climate. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, lots of petrol heads there with nice cars. Yes, nice Brilliant. cars. 
And so now you are, no, what's your, let me try and get your full title correct, your global training manager for Rupes? Chief janitor, I <laughs> mop the floors at mm -hmm. the new training center. I know <laughs> the feeling. He's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my title is um, uh, global director of training. So we coordinate our training efforts around the world in mm -hmm. 72 countries. Uh, but we've also built a new training center in, in Denver, yeah, Colorado. Yeah, in Colorado, yeah. So uh, I manage that. Yeah, hit it up. If you have a quick Google and stuff, there are some wonderful pictures of the building. Because it was a new build, wasn't it? It was all brand new. It's ground you know, up. At this time of our interview, it's less than three months we've been in there mm. in the building. So. And the big thing Jason was saying is that in the past, all the machines have been made in Italy, which is great. But Italy is a long way, and you need like seven pigeons to carry each machine over to America. <laughs> um, and so now you've got Italian design, but it's also manufactured in the states for the domestic market, yes. which I'm actually, from a marketing point of view and a practical point of view, it's, is really really useful. It's a fantastic position to be in in the tool category Italian engineering made in USA it's it's fabulous, a winning it's yeah. a winning thing if only Alfa Romeo's were built in the US <laughs> as well hey? um, but what I found really really interesting is you go you spend your life on the road we were talking earlier today and I was saying oh you know I knew Jason was flying away um, back to I thought back to the States but now he's got another two or three places to land on, on, on this tour yes. um, by the sounds of it you've been just about everywhere it's Fairly consistent, about 50% of my time is traveling somewhere, doing training events, and it happens to be the part of my job that I really enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of other parts that, you know, everybody has a job, they have different uh, tasks to yeah. do, but um, I don't enjoy the airports and the planes and all that part. And but, but the first class seats are quite nice with all the <laughs> going back. What is that like? <laughs> I don't know. I, would I just, like I to just know. Google it. <laughs> I hide in the hold. Um, but I, I do enjoy when I get there and uh, I get to interact with detailers, and that's that's fabulous. That's really, yeah. Because I think you're pretty much in a u unique position. I mean, I know some guys with some of our members, for example, go over to the states and train with somebody for a, for a week or something. Um, but to actually constantly spend the time on the road, and obviously you're you know highly experienced and the rest of it. But I'm sure there's still a learning curve. You know, somebody can show uh, you something that you've never seen before. I. Uh, I learn every trip that I go on, I learn something new. So it's, you're never at a point where I think you learn everything. You can't possibly know everything. Because as soon as you do know a lot, uh, something changes on you, like the surfaces on the car change, or technology in a new tool, a new compound, something gets introduced and all of a sudden, game changed, you know? How do you cope with the language barrier? I mean, for example, I mean, do you know what the Australian is for hotel? <laughs> Actually, the language uh, thing around the world, I go to many, many countries where the, the first language obviously is not English. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very, very fortunate in that respect because uh, the training events that I do around the world, I usually am partnered with either my local colleague from Rupus mm -hmm. is there who does speak, speak yeah. English and can translate, or we work with a local distributor and usually their technical people Are bilingual, can yeah. uh, translate as well. And then there's a lot of countries, you know, like um, the UK, where uh, even though it's a different English, uh, I don't need a translator. Sorry, well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, in fact, the only Americanism I heard today was the hood of the car. Um, it, and uh, the hood is, I'm guessing you mean the bit at the front that covers the engine. Yes. Yes, that's called a bonnet. Bonnet, yes. A bonnet, yes. Okay. Um, but don't worry, you know. Um, so, um, what I really want to know is, is uh, you pick up lots of different bits and techniques and around, and you were mentioning, tell me about uh, Southeast Asia and their sticky paint issue. Yeah, that actually, um, I forget how many years ago, but it was a few years ago, I started hearing uh, rumblings and grumblings and complaints about the sticky paint, and I asked, uh, what is this, what is the problem, and people say, oh, it's a nightmare, and such a challenge to finish this paint out without having a mm. dramatic problem with it. So the issue was it was very, very soft, and so you can you correct it to a point, but then it's in the final stages that you end up putting marks back into it. Back, it's uh, very susceptible to re-marring the paint. Um, but it's also, in addition to being uh, soft, was very absorbent. So the porosity of the paint, you put compounds or polishes in, it would instantly dry out. like. You know, one pass with the polisher and it was gone, and it was dried out. So that I have to admit, of all, I mean, I'm learning hugely. I'm not a detailer. I, I just go around talking about it the whole time. I'm the ultimate keyboard detailer. <laughs> um, but uh, was the thing I was fascinated by the idea of paint being porous? Yes. Um, I just didn't realize it's, that. It's it's like your your human skin. It's uh, elastic. It has porosity. 
uh, fluids can transfer through it. It's a semi-permeable membrane. That's mm -hmm. what our conventional paint systems are. And the reason for that is because a vehicle, a car, has a usually a metal substrate of some kind or some composite or whatever, but some kind of a substrate that in throughout the day it heat you know heat gets on the the car and it could expand these substrates mm -hmm. so w through heat and cold cycles mm -hmm. the substrate expands and contracts like all metals do so it kind of has to have holes to be able to cope with that it so has it doesn't to, fatigue yeah. if the paint was not elastic it would always crack and mm -hmm. you would, your paint would not last very long Right. So it has to be elastic, but the human skin is the same way. We all, whether we realize it or not, on a hot day compared to cold day, our skin is expanding and contracting. And I know. I mean, after a shower, I have to actually wring it all out. It's, it's, it's <laughs> weird. Um, and so that was having, and I remember, uh, Jason's being modest here, you're more or less called in as a sort of emergency to go in there and try and work out a way of fixing it. And you were saying you're trying all different sort of things and nothing works, but then you found a solution. Yeah, so the first challenge for me was I wanted to see what they were talking about. And, of course, when I went there, I, I believe it was in Taiwan, the first time I had seen this. And they brought in, they brought in a car, and it didn't re reproduce the effect that they were complaining about. They mm -hmm. said, well, I'm not seeing it on this car. Well, that didn't help me and no. tried to help them. <laughs> you need the symptoms, um, yeah. So it happened to be the next day, and then all of a sudden the car came in, and bam, there was this sticky paint scenario. They said, see, this is it. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And it was uh, an effect on, uh, as a result of polishing that I had never seen before. Never yeah, seen never that. come across it. So basically a couple passes with the polisher, everything dried up, and the reason it's called sticky paint is the paint is not actually sticky, but yeah. the compound residue got sticky, it stuck to the paint. Oh, wow, and yeah. When you tried to wipe it with a, a microfiber towel, leaving marks in you it. were leaving marks. So gotcha, and whereabouts paint. Southeast Asia, it's, it's a big place, isn't it? Are we talking well, Malaysia? Well, after, after I first saw it in, I believe it was Taiwan, but mm -hmm. I began to see this sticky paint scenario in Thailand, in, Malaysia and in Indonesia, uh, and the common theme was, and I apologize to the Japanese ahead of time, but it was Japanese <laughs> cars, Yeah. and it was specifically Japanese cars painted in Japan that had been imported like, into like these other, <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, and it wasn't every car, it was like a semi-random occurrence, it wasn't every single Japanese car. So, um, but was it, if it was the same model and color, was it generally speaking, say if it was an Infinity particular no, model? No, there was no consistency on model and color, it just happened to be... That's bizarre. Yeah, it, it's yeah. not every car it was X percent of the cars had this sticky paint scenario. And how did you fix it in the end? Well, with a lot of trial and error, because uh, I was trying to adjust technique, I was trying to adjust product choice, pad choice, tool choice, the whatever to uh, remedy this. And what I learned was the the problem is a result of the paint not liking friction or heat. Mm -hmm. And so we had to try any kind of a scenario of product combination and technique to reduce that surface friction. And we came up with some stuff that is kind of l out of the ordinary, wasn't Yeah. Are we allowed to say what it was or is oh it all yeah, very secret? No, yeah. no. It's, uh, if it helps people with sticky paint. Yeah. So there's three three things. There's the tool, there's the the compound and pad choice, but also a technique. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of these folks were experiencing this problem with the rotary. Okay, which which rotary is producing a lot of heat and a lot of power yeah. there, a lot of correction ability. So um, the first thing we would suggest is you know change the movement of the tool. L let me guess. Did you suggest a large throw DA by chance? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That, isn't it? <laughs> But it happened to help because yeah. that large orbit actually helped to reduce uh, the friction and heat on the paint. The other thing we did, which was bizarre, um, counterintuitive, I guess is the word, is we would take a very porous uh, cutting pad, you know, so a, a car that, or a pad that was branded as a, this is for removing heavy defects. So aggressive, yeah. Aggressive. But we weren't removing heavy defects. We were in mild to moderate defects, but we put this pad on that particular sticky paint. The other thing we did is we went the opposite side of the spectrum on the aggressiveness of the liquid compound to oh, use. So an aggressive pad and a very fine compound. Exactly. That's fascinating, isn't it? It's yeah. And normally you wouldn't do that combination, but... Was it still foam pad or were you using wool? We were using full uh, foam, but we, uh, in a different country, um, in Malaysia, I found that our new Rupus wool pads mm -hmm. that are DA applied 
did fantastic on sticky paint. But the, the recommendation for the pad choice is just reduce surface area. Yeah. So find some kind of a pad material that has less surface area. And thus less friction, thus less heat. Exactly. That makes absolute sense. And then the technique adjustment was um, uh, everybody was trying to do the normal technique for polishing. Mm -hmm. uh, Multiple passes. Mo and moderate yeah. pressure, multiple passes, maybe higher tool speed. So what we did is try to go less aggressive and create less friction. So less tool speed, faster arm speed. Yeah. And we... Thus you've got less time on a particular patch, which is thus exactly. reducing the temperature and the, all the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. And also perhaps spraying water. That was another thing we mm. tried, which would add some more fluid on well, the surface. Well, spraying water, that is an interesting topic. Today, um, and now I'd heard of it because I talked to James Walker, who's a, another repairs trainer in this country, and he, um, about a year and a half ago, talked to me about this, this water polishing system. Yeah. And I thought, it, I, you know, he, he's from Chepstow. I thought maybe, you know, he'd had a bit of a night <laughs> out. He was going a bit wild. Um, but no, and, and when you explain today, you, quite regularly you're asking people to put their hands up if they've heard of something. Yeah. And almost everything, you know, so who's used a wool pad? Everybody put their hands up. Who's used a rotary? About three people put their hand up, you know. Yeah. Um, but with water, nobody, apart from James, and to be honest, we didn't really notice this because he's, you know, he's, he starts from quite a low position, so with a hand up, <laughs> still can't see him. He's going to kill me for this. Yeah. Um, but um, he had the only one. And I was fascinated by all these detailers in one room, and yet there's this water system that you've been using. I mean, I've seen it on, on YouTube and stuff for quite a while. Been using that approach for years, and um, I was actually quite surprised by mm -hmm. this audience. Uh, usually, peop more people have tried it by now, but I think a lot of people have heard of it. Mm. Well, I think in this country, there's, we've got lots of different levels of detailer, obviously, but the guys, quite often the guys with a lot of experience, kind of, there's an element of just, sort of just sitting back, yeah, I know how to do detailing, now I don't need to learn anything new. Yeah. And that's the great thing about today. We had guys with who have been in the industry a couple of years and ones who have been in there for 15, 20 years. Sure, sure. Um, and all of them were learning, and that's the magic of these courses. Yeah. Um, but explain in, in brief how, the, um, how you use water in machine polishing. Well, it's uh, kind of a concept where you do a full buffing cycle, a normal buffing cycle, a normal application of compound. Uh, and you would do this on defected paint that you're trying to remove defects. So we do an, what you would consider a normal application, however many passes that is, mm -hmm. whatever it is to you. Uh, then, before you wipe the residue off, you would lightly mist on with a trigger spray or just a light mist of water, and then re uh, reapply, or not reapply compound, but reapply yeah. the pad with the remaining residue on the pad and do another couple of passes, maybe two or three Two or passes. three, yeah, yeah. And that's it, and then you wipe the residue off. So it's kind of a two-stage application. Yeah. But you said it actually improves cut if it's a diminishing compound. By putting the water on there, you're kind of restoring the cut potentially to a level higher than when than the, the early part first went on. Yes. Um, and then also from a refining point of view, it gets it to a better level in the end. Yes. And this was an interesting thing because everybody in the room were professional detailers. At the end of the day, time is money and offering your best customer value. You know, I'm 300 pounds a day. Um, this is what I can achieve in a day. Yes. Jason was pointing out how you go, you can actually cut out the odd stage with the use of the large flow DAs absolutely. and uh, the water system um, and that was absolutely fascinating and obviously then people got to go and have a play and have a use with it. Um, can you use it on wool pads or is what, what, what It actually can, can be used on any type of pad, foam, microfiber, wool. Even, it happened, denim? It, huh? Even denim pads for those uh, in the uh, 1980s? I haven't tried the denim Mm. Pad approach yeah, with water yet. I haven't tried that. Not be worth trying it. I mean, it's I, interesting though. The only research I can give, I've, I own many jeans and they're often soggy. <laughs> but but you I don't cut them in circles and make a pad. No, I just them. slide over the bonnet. Just on my <laughs> oh, own. Just like, yeah, just like in a movie. That's how you polish with denim. Yeah, neighbors okay. ask me to stop, but oh. I still do it. Um, I just yell cowabunga and all goes well. Um, <laughs> but, but mostly fiber pads. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but the f fiber pads with the spraying water approach tends to work much better. You can do it with foam, but. Uh, and it really was a approach that was developed with rotary and, yeah. then, and then migrated into application with dual action orbital polishers. And we have to give credit where credit's due. Kevin Brown mm -hmm. you know, really is the one that brought awareness to this approach. I'm sure he wasn't the first one that ever sprayed water, but <laughs> he kind of brought, raised the awareness of it. And spraying water or water polishing 
is not a new concept for no. other industries. Well, in in the body shop trade, back in, in the times with um, we used uh, well, I say we, not me. I was you know a wee child, um, but uh, you know when you're using compounds in body shops, they would often use it with water. There's you know it, it was it was customary. It's actually not a new concept, but you can be on glass, you can be on uh, metals, and there's lots of other industries that are doing polishing or cutting, and those activities are done with water. Yeah. So it's it it was a matter of taking what works in another area, another industry, and seeing if it'll work on automotive paint, then it happens to work fabulous. It's fascinating you say that. We've been to quite a few chemical manufacturers, and a lot of them there are talking about the uh, cross-fertilization of chemical technology from, strangely, inks and printing um, over to car care. Both Angel Wax and Car Chem both said that their background was in inks and printing, and mm. they were able to utilize that tech to come across. Interesting. Um, and actually, on the chemical choice, one thing I learned today again is, um, you know, Rupes, they make machines. That's your thing. Um, and uh, there are lots of other companies, well, not lots, but there are some other companies who make machines and stuff. But the point you made was that your uh, compounds are also made in-house. So you, you've obviously got in-house chemists who do your own compounds, as opposed to the whole kind of white label, we'll stick our thing on, it works with our machine, so why not, you know? Um, not pointing fingers, obviously, because I don't want to get sued again. But, um, <laughs> again. The, but, <laughs> um, but you do make them all in-house, I imagine, in Italy. Yeah, so actually it's kind of a unique position that we have in the marketplace and that the the, the motors of our tools are completely engineered and made by us. The, the, the entire tool is manufactured, mm. assembled in our facility. And the pad and the whole system. And the system. backing plates, yeah. uh, the pads, and, and now more recently the compounds and polishes. So mm. everything that impacts the result, the, the only thing that we don't have control of in the whole system is the person who's the person using behind it. the wheel. Oh, don't look at me. I, <laughs> I don't touch them. They scare me. Um, but yes, yeah, no. Well, that's 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 great. And I appreciate you've you've flown in yesterday, and you've got to where are you off to tomorrow? We are our team. By the way, we have a great Rupus training. It's team huge. Here. They've got their security guards. They've got mini buses. <laughs> lots of guys with shades. It's really it's a bit of a deal. They had to do a background check on me. They haven't got the results <laughs> back yet. No, we have some great trainers here. We've got some, uh, you know, from Italy and some from other parts of the world, like Torben and uh, Fabrizio and uh, David Kindle from. He's the UK. well. He's from Milton Keynes, which is pretty exotic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the local UK team. So, fabulous group of trainers that we have at this event here. But mm. we're some of us are moving on, some are not going. But we're we have another training event in Holland. Mm -hmm. And then after that is a two-day event in Sweden. Oh, wow. And then I'm off from Sweden to Italy to do some more product development work. And we also have another training event in Italy. Um, so, yeah. Lots Sounds of like a pretty events. exciting life, isn't it? <laughs> um, just to wrap up, I've got a final question for you, which is you have obviously been all around the world. You've seen detailing in lots of different places. If you were to put money on, I mean, traditionally, America is pretty much at the forefront of detailing. Um, I would suggest, I might be wrong, it's arguable, but I would say America have been um, investing a lot in it and they've been you know, pushing forward. Um, latterly now with ceramic coatings and stuff, for example, coming from the Far East, yes. um, there's influence there. And I know in the US there's this sort of impression about the Brits, sort of because we've been around a lot longer, you know, we've been doing this since the medieval times and, and, <laughs> and Queen Victoria was probably a detailer and all this, which is kind of slightly rubbish. Uh, we, <laughs> we all watch YouTube and learn how you guys do it. Um, where do you think is the next hot place? Medita where are you seeing the guys? I mean, Scandinavia, for example, has got a lot of talent there and a lot of, um, I know Finland and Norway are particularly keen. Well, I think as far as leading um, game-changing technologies or leading new technologies, what's happening lately, which is quite fascinating for me, because as I've been traveling around for 25 years looking mm -hmm. at detailers and how they do things, and 20 years ago there was a, a big gap between how detailing happens in you know, Australia compared mm -hmm. to China, compared to... Well, they're there, kangaroo pad, didn't they? That was really good. <laughs> So the gaps in how procedures and choice of products, they, they used to be very different. Uh, over a 20-year period, I've been slowly watching this, this U gap. Unification, yeah. And I suspect the internet might have had something to do with that. The, the global, global interweb nets, uh, <laughs> cyber interweb nets have kind of made this community smaller. And so that gap is now shrinking. There still are some differences, but what's very exciting to me is when we see detailing in other parts of the world, there are some very strong commonalities and it's usually in the area of the passion the detailers have and um, 
the disease that detailers have. <laughs> You know, well, it's the point. They always say OCD, and, and, and in this country, you know, it's obsessive compulsive detailing sort of side. Um, and it's a slightly awkward because here, OCD is a proper disease. I mean, you, people with OCD turn light switches off and on ten times, and some of them can't even go out the house. It's, so it's we, a real yeah, it's a real deal, thing. Yeah. And so we end up with guys saying, "Oh, I'm so OCD," and they're sitting next to somebody who hasn't been outside for three years. I'm like, <laughs> God, just, 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 you know, yes. think of a different phrase. Pedantic. Pedantic <laughs> works. A bit anal can be used in most yes, places. It's, I just it's, say it's a disease. We have this <laughs> disease. Um, but it's it's exciting for me to see that disease and that illness because it exists everywhere. The and pandemic, I suppose, then you could call it. And there's some crazy detailers that just, you know, try and do that 100% defect removal and the, the mm -hmm. show car finish on every single car, even if they're not being paid for that. You yeah. Know? That disease exists everywhere. No, I can imagine. Well, particularly if you own something like a Fiat Panda or something like that, you know, you get very excited about it. Um, so I think it, you know, there's some things that are just similar around the world, and then there's some things that are very different. Mm. Um, but I see similar challenges, like some of the challenges that were expressed today on, in the polishing area. Oh, yeah, I recognize that challenge because, you know, they mm. have that in China as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just exciting to, to see those major differences now the gaps are getting smaller and smaller yeah. but as far as advances in technology I think the the next big waves I think there's got to be something that's going to happen with battery technology I think that's yeah, going to be the next that. frontier yeah well I, I, I heard that from an, another company that make machines that we, sh we shan't mention at all because it's, it's, it would be very inflexible for me to do so um, <laughs> and, and they were saying they, they totally concurred is, yeah. that, is that battery tech is, is going to be the I thing I think that's going to be the next game changing evolution in technology uh, uh, you know I don't know where the paint coating thing's going um, but we're ultimately we're getting close to just relacquering cars with the strength of these um, you know ceramic coats on yeah, yeah so. basically wipe on paint you know after yeah. that well, it's a mystery, and I'm sure we will find out in many years to come. But thank you very much, Jason. Yes, it's been really pleasure. appreciated. And um, we will, uh, I'm sure, touch base soon, and we'll try and get you in Pro Detailer magazine. Uh, we had Todd Cooper and others in, right in there, and it'd be great to have a, a nice sort of long, long interview with yourself if you can. I'd be happy to. Brilliant. All right, then. I hope you enjoyed part one. Uh, the interview with Jason Rose was good fun. Uh, he's a very knowledgeable guy uh, and an absolute pleasure to deal with. Um, if you would like to subscribe to our channel to see more videos, click here. And if you'd like to see part two where we interview Alan Medcraft of AM Details up in Elgin, click here.